is Bible Talks. Our purpose is to defend the Bible as the divine revelation of the God of heaven. We believe that it must be studied, understood, believed, and faithfully obeyed. We believe that we must give book, chapter, and verse for all that we do in the name of God's religion. Then and only then can we be pleasing to the God of heaven, His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit who gave us the Bible. Your questions are welcomed. Thank you for tuning in this morning. Thank you for joining us again for Bible Talks. My name is Chris Kramer with the Northside Church of Christ in Russellville, Kentucky. I'm here with Nick Greenman, who preaches for the Christian Home Congregation in Morgantown. And uh, we'll let you know about our work in just a few moments. But uh, to help prepare you for our study this morning, we're going to begin our study from uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So if you'll get your Bibles ready, we'll be discussing the first few verses in Paul's Apostle to the Corinthian Brethren. We thank you for tuning in, and if you're a regular listener, you know every Saturday morning, Bible Talks is presented uh, through WRUS, uh, the radio station here in Russellville. Uh, but we simultaneously uh, show this program on our YouTube channel for the Northside Church of Christ. And so just do a search there and you can find that information so you can uh, share that and go back and listen to the lesson from time to time. So you can see a live uh, version of us. And we are um, uh, normally bringing this program in a call-in format. We haven't done it for a while because of the uh, virus and the pandemic, and we just don't know when we'll have the opportunity to do that again. So for now, we'll just be bringing you lessons, but you are welcome to be a part of this study. Uh, just email us with questions or comments or even topics that you would like to discuss at Northside Church of Christ at hotmail.com. And if you're watching the video portion of this, you'll see that on the bottom of the screen. Northside Church of Christ meets in Russellville, Kentucky at 689 North Main Street. And right now, during this interesting time, we are meeting in the parking lot at 10 o'clock every Saturday morning. Uh, we meet in our cars and uh, we present lessons. Um, uh, outside through um, a radio transmitter so everyone can sit in their air conditioning and be comfortable and uh, we partake of the elements of uh, of uh, the worship to God through the Lord's Supper and the singing of hymns together and there are a few drawbacks but all in all we're we're able to be together and uh, able to greet one another and to uh, be able to be in one another's presence as we give praise honor and glory to God and, and that's the way we're practicing at this time uh, we have many that do have health concerns and health issues, and we want to keep everyone as safe as, as possible. Not all congregations are meeting in that way, though, and uh, so that is certainly up to uh, uh, those individual congregations. And, of course, we're trying to abide by government mandates and so on uh, for the safety of everyone. But we'll see how times change in the weeks to come, and you share your thoughts with us on that. Uh, Brother Nick, it's good to have you with us as always. You are uh, preaching there in Morgantown. Tell us about the work there. We well, appreciate again this uh, next week here to be with you all and to study from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And if you're in the Butler County area tomorrow, uh, around 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, you are welcome to come out to our services. We are having in-house services at 10 o'clock at 3628 Love Lee Road. Uh, that's L-O-V-E-L-E-E, -E -E, not lovely, but lovely. Uh, I have it on the bottom of the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and... And so uh, that's Highway 411 off of Highway 70 between Morgantown and Brownsville around the Jetson area. And we just ask that you wear the face masks and practice the social distancing when you come. We've got extra chairs set up so that we can facilitate that. And we love to see you, love to get to meet you if you're new to the area. So come on out. All right. Plenty of opportunities to worship God and to give praise to his name. There's nothing that can stop us from doing that. And so we invite you to listen to this program every week, but you may have to step away from the radio for a moment. You may be at home. Well, uh, put it on your phone. You can go to a TuneIn app or there are various radio programs. You can go to WRUSradio.com and you can listen to this worldwide. So uh, there are lots of opportunities to hear. So don't think that you have to walk out of the house and run some errands and not take us with you. So for the next uh, 50 minutes or so, we're going to be discussing matters of God's word. And we hope that you'll stick with us, be patient with us, as uh, we discuss matters from 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We, 
left off in our last study by talking about spiritual discernment and having a spiritual mind to judge things, whether they be things of this world or whether they be things of, of course, a godly nature, to look at these things through God's eyes, to think with a spiritual mindedness that we not judge God's word, especially by just using the mind of men. Certainly we are bound to this flesh. Uh, we have to think with our human minds and we, we think and reason based upon our own individual and personal levels of education and experiences that we've had in life. But the, the word of God, the Bible is our sole source of information uh, that we use to process uh, number one, the difference between right and wrong. And we can see in the world the difference between right and wrong. So as Christians, we try to make our judgments based upon God's word. Uh, we Amen. try not to let social media or news or governments or whatever dictate how we're going to think, especially about God's word and especially about uh, matters in the world. So we need to uh, think clearly and have a spiritual mind. And how do we do that? Well, we do that through the study of God's word. I always encourage people to go to the book of Proverbs and read about wisdom uh, that an individual should have so that when they uh, study the rest of the scriptures, especially the New Testament, they'll be thinking more with a godly mind and, and seeing the examples from the Old Testament of those godly people and people of faith and, and looking at how we can serve our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ today with the same heart and attitude. And that's why they're there. Um, Hebrews chapter 11 teaches us about many of those great examples of faith. And though our laws today are different because we live in the Christian age, since Jesus died on the cross, he uh, put to rest the matters of the old covenant uh, and fulfilled those things. Uh, we have a new covenant between us and God. But um, Amen on that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, for those of you on Facebook, uh, go to uh, uh, Nick's, uh, some of his past videos. He's just completed a series in regard to the prophecies in the Old Testament that lead up to Jesus Christ. And so you can learn a lot about the kingdom and, uh, and see the studies that he's having there. And uh, those have been very encouraging as well. And what it does is it paints for us a, a picture of the, of the entire Bible, of the history of man and uh, how it's led up to who we are as uh, servants of the Lord today. But I don't want to get too far off of our, our subject matter for today because we are talking about uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and we've asked you to turn there several times. So we'll go ahead and begin our study uh, with verse 1 so that we can see Paul's concern for the church. He's already addressed some in the first chapter. And even though he overall has been commending their faith up to this point, uh, he's addressed the divisions that they have by comparing them to the way that mere men act in the world, the human mind and human thinking. And so whereas he has condemned uh, human reasoning, he's also telling the church here in Corinth, you're thinking the same way. You're trying to reason your problems and your divisions by using man's judgment and man's ideas, and, and it just can't be done. So even though he's addressed their, their divisions and warned them about the dangers of false teaching, now he, in essence, is saying, we see you're behaving the same way as the world, and you are being as children. And so in verse 1, he, he addresses them as such. If you want to read that, Nick, and uh, we'll start discussing this um, this chapter just verse one or you want me to read the verse four uh you can look at the whole context and then we'll just discuss it by uh verse by verse all right uh, it says in verse one and i brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people but as to carnal as to babes in christ i fed you with milk and not with solid food for until now you were not able to receive it and even now you are still not able for you are still carnal for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like mere men? For when one says, I am of Paul, and another, I am of Apollos, are you not carnal? I think there's a lot in these passages. Um, and uh, kind of an overall theme, if we were to look at it as such, is I see a, uh, there's going to be a lot of discussion about the church and, and their attitudes toward uh, preachers and teachers of the gospel. And, um, you know, how they need to um, respect each other. But at the same time, we're going to be looking heavily at giving God 
uh, the praise and giving God the credit for who we are as Christians. We don't hold ourselves up as, as mere men and say, you know, look at us and look at our abilities and, and we falter and fail in those human traits many, many times. So we need to look at the, the divine inspiration of God, but yet he's saying, I must speak to you like you were children as just babes in Christ. I'm, I'm having to go back to the beginning again, whereas you've already been established as Christians. They've been obedient to the Lord, but yet uh, they've allowed their thinking to become immature, uh, perhaps stagnant, and they're just not growing. It's a, it's a, it's a good lesson on growth. And in our last study uh, last week, we went ahead and mentioned Ephesians, excuse me, Hebrews uh, chapter 5, and made reference to the fact that the same terminology is used there. And the writer of the Hebrew letter points out that even they, uh, at a certain point, needed to become uh, more mature in their faith and needed to have a better understanding of God's word. He said in verse 11 of Hebrews chapter 5, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain. This is talking of Jesus Christ, of course, since you have become dull of hearing. And so for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And that thought will carry on in the sixth chapter of Hebrews as well. But just to uh, stop there for a moment, he's talking about having a mature mind and, and mm -hmm. thinking with a mature mind, not only in the knowledge that we need to have from God's word, as Hosea, is it four verse six that says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. Thanks, um, sir. I'll look it up for you. Okay, it's either 4-6 or 6-4. Four. I always get those two confused. <laughs> but um, what he's comparing them to is, of course, um, the immaturity of man, the flesh, the carnal mind. And in this, if you remember from our last study, we're talking about reasoning from a, a spiritual mind. And how do we gain a spiritual mind? I mentioned at the beginning of our program today the uh, wisdom in going to Proverbs and studying um, about the wisdom of God. Uh, we've studied in the past about how there is that difference between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Uh, I think it's the book of James that addresses that. The fact that we, so many times, the more we learn in this life, the smarter we think we become. But do we distance ourselves from God and his word? I mean, look at what's happened in our society already. The majority of people think that, you know, we've come from, um, you know, evolution. Uh, that all these things just happened by some sort of accident. And what people aren't realizing is that those things were created to take God out of the equation. And it really saddens me today to see that there are so-called churches and, and religious doctrines that actually teach um, you know, a theistic evolution. They, they don't want to remove God, but, but they also want to just say, well, well, this is how he did it. And I've talked with many people over the years that just say, well, it's just generally understood that God used evolution to create us. And I don't mean to get off on a different tangent of, of that particular study, but, but that lies at the heart of the matter as to how men think mm -hmm. and why they <laughs> removed various elements, even from our salvation, baptism and other things. Go ahead, Nick. Yeah, it's that contrast between human wisdom and godly wisdom. Uh, you know, godly wisdom leads you down one particular path and human wisdom leads you down to another. Um, and, and, of course, when we're looking at this passage here, again, he, he goes back to the very fundamental purpose of writing this letter is that the fact that there are divisions amongst the, the church there in Corinth. Uh, there are factions. People have split and splintered into different groups. And, and that's really what Paul is trying to address. And he's trying to show that they are demonstrating the human wisdom by doing that very thing and, and not practicing uh, godly wisdom by being united and being of the same mind. And my meditation on this has to bring me back to today and, and not just in the church, but in, in society, uh, there is a, a gross representation of division in, in the United States right now. And, and 
we see that happening in the church here in Corinth. And if it can easily happen in the church, how much worse would it be in a godless society? And you just take a look around you. I mean, the uh, the division between the Republican and Democrat, the conservative and the liberal, it, it is just, uh, it is so wide. I, I don't know, you know, if it can be healed right at this point. But, um, I mean, I, I, I hope for unification. I pray for unification. I pray for this nation to, to be strong and, and resolute like it once was. But uh, again, as we said at the beginning, I have to come back to the scriptures and, and the scriptures have to be my, my unification. Well, I've, I've got a further thought on that because when I look back at the history of man, the only time that I've ever seen unity, whether it's among political parties or, or, or races of people, um, or any faction in life, it's always because men jumped on board with what the Bible had to say and people trying to restore unity. And, and I think the only times that you really see unity, even in our country in recent history, has only been when men have come together regarding what the word says. And I know throughout history, they haven't done it perfect. But when men seek God, uh, you're going to find they're all heading in the same d direction. Uh, you can't just say, let's all have unity. What people usually mean by when mm -hmm. they say that is, uh, well, you just believe my along. way and we'll have unity. Yeah. Now, yeah. on one hand, God is saying that, so I've got no problem with that. But if the basis of unity is not the the source from God, you know, it, we're bound to just always be divided because we're always going well, to have an opinion as to how things should yeah, be. Yeah, it's that standard, right? You know, that standard that we measure up to. Well, who standard? Who sets that standard? Uh, Chris, if you set that standard, it, you know, it might be here. If I set the standard, it might be here. And and I say, you need to meet me, or you say, I, meet, I need to meet you. You know, who can justify whose standard is correct? Uh, I mean, I mean we're, we're equally men, and we're equally fallible. Uh, you might have some good ideas. I might have some good ideas, but you might have some bad ideas and I might have some bad <laughs> ideas. So we have to come to an agreement on a standard that, you know, that is sure and steadfast and that it is built by someone who isn't uh, fallible. And that is, of course, uh, the God of all creation and his standard. Well, if, if you'd go back and, and listen to some of our previous studies uh, that I've done video series on on our YouTube channel from uh, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, uh, excuse me, Thessalonians. 2nd uh, Thessalonians deals heavily with Paul trying to establish and, and reestablish with the brethren that, look, I'm an apostle given his authority by Jesus Christ. What I'm telling you is divine inspiration. I'm not telling you something of my own making or in my own mind. I'm, 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 you know, he signs the letter. I, Paul, you know, he's establishing that you've heard variations of the word from the, what, what people are telling you, what people are writing to you, but we need to come together on, on the set word. And I think that leads into mm -hmm. what verse two says in our study for today in first Corinthians three and verse two, when he says, I fed you, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it, and even now you're still not able. He's saying, what I've been giving you, you're supposed to build on, you're supposed to grow, uh, grow in your faith toward God, uh, but of course he's rebuking them for not having done that. But we can refer back to verse 1 and see the same you know, argument in regard to uh, the milk and the meat and so on. But I, I look seriously, and of course as a preacher of the gospel, I read more into these passages than perhaps I would otherwise because I have a responsibility to feed. Uh, I have a responsibility to teach. And, and where's that information coming from? Is it from God's word? Is it from my own mind? Do I want people to follow me or do I want them to follow God? And that's something that Thanks. you have to test every teacher and preacher by. You know, after some time though, a teacher would hope that his words are taken seriously and applied to the lives of the student. Um, it's discouraging uh, to be ignored. It's discouraging to be rebelled against. Uh, every parent probably has this situation from time to time where you tell your child to do something and they just, you know, adamantly mm -hmm. refuse. And of course, uh, yeah. you have to discipline them. But, um, well, I'll give you an example. You ever have a scary dream? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Never. <laughs> we, <laughs> I don't know anybody that doesn't have nightmares, but I'll tell you a recurring nightmare that I've had for years and years. And um, 
it's been standing in front of an assembly, uh, in most cases, a congregation, a church of our Lord Jesus Christ, and, and everybody's there, and everybody's doing their thing. But for some reason, I'm speaking, but no one can hear me. The words are coming out of my mouth, but no one can hear me. Uh, and everybody's just looking at each other, and it's just, you know, there's no organization, and, and it's like I'm screaming at the top of my lungs trying to be heard. Uh, and trying to teach the word of God, but, but basically being ignored. And uh, that's, a, I don't have that dream all the time. I probably will tonight that I, now that I'm thinking about it, but, <laughs> um, you know, standing in a crowd where no one can hear you uh, is a very, uh, a very frustrating thing, especially when you are giving a message of, of such, uh, you know, dire times and, the danger that is out there. It's like yelling to somebody that there's, you know, there's, there's something in your way. There's a danger there. Um, you, you tell your children, don't touch something that's going to hurt you. And uh, in, in desperation, we're running toward them and the words are trying to come out and they act like they don't even listen to us. So that's, that's one of my nightmares. <laughs> mm -hmm. But I think in a lot of ways, it's also a reality that many preachers face because there are many that will not heed and will not listen and do not uh, pay, and I'll say respect toward the word of God. Uh, we're not looking for our own praise or admonition. We're going to talk about that in some of our later verses here. But one of the verses that comes to my mind um, to cross references in James chapter one and uh, verses 19 through 24, because in this, it gives us the admonition to hear, uh, the attitude that we need to hear and to open our hearts and minds to what is the truth so that we can apply these things and not forget. Uh, a lot of what God has given us in his word really, I think, is summed up by, by these two words. Don't forget <laughs> uh, or remember. Uh, Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper so that we partake each and every first day of the week so that we will remember. It's uh, remembering is uh, a memorial in and of itself, but it also indicates, I don't want you to forget these things. And we need mm -hmm. to be reminded of these things. In James 1, 19 and following, he says, so then my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. I'll stop there and just indicate that if we, no, um, oh, I was always reminded in verse 19 that, you know, we have two ears and one mouth. We need to listen twice as much as we talk. <laughs> and then you look at the word that's been given to us, the word that can save our souls, but it won't save our souls by hearing only. It saves mm -hmm. our souls by being doers of that word. And working the good works of God, as Ephesians 2 and verse 10 teaches us. But he goes on to, to go say, along if with anyone, that, Chris. Sir? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, you finish your, your context there. Oh, okay. So I was well, thinking, thinking of a passage in Peter uh, that talks about reminding. But you, you, uh, you finish your context and then I'll stir you I'll up by reminding you. Yeah, bring that up in a second there because it's okay. important. And I'll just say this before we go on is that you may be listening to us and saying, well, I've heard these things before. Well, good, you know, and you'll keep hearing them. You know, people question us all the time. Why do you keep talking about this subject or that subject? Why do you keep talking about baptism? Because people need to be reminded daily. Uh, search the scriptures daily to find out what is so. Because if we stop talking about them, then people won't do them. And when we don't defend the truth, people forget mm -hmm. the truth. Uh, there are several subjects that I am trying to prepare lessons on right now because I've been hearing people talk about things um, of a worldly nature or doctrine of God's word through, through man's eyes. Uh, an issue uh, came up about the rapture the other day, and I'm preparing some lessons on that because what I realized, the more we don't talk about them, the more people tend to draw their own conclusions to what those things mean. And then, of or course, you've got those that oppose you. Like, why do we talk so much about baptism? Because the majority of the world saying you don't have to do it. We have to defend it almost every single day. Uh, but let me continue in this passage here when he says in verse 23, for if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror for he observes himself, goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. 
you know, when we forget who we are, when we forget what we look like, when we forget, you know, we can, we can brush our teeth, but you know, five minutes later, we may get something stuck in our teeth. I mean, you don't know what's going on unless you observe and we don't, you know, carry mirrors with us every day of our life, but we need to let the Lord in essence be our mirror for life to see who we are. Again, I keep using the phrase, look at life through God's eyes. And when you do that, you can see more clearly. And so we need to be swift to hear, be doers of the word. And I believe as much of the new Testament teaches us, we need to enact self-control, control of the mind, control of our thoughts, control of our perspectives, our thinking, our reasoning. That's where Paul mm -hmm. is really trying to get to the heart of the matter. He's not just saying, do this and do this. He's saying, think like this. Make it a part of who you are. My mother used to always teach me growing up, remember who you are. It took me years to realize and remember, you know, and understand what that meant. Um, and, and living up to the things that I was being taught, especially from God's word. But we need to remember every time I walk out the door, you know, as a teenager, remember who you are, you know, and uh, uh, who was I and who am I? And that's what I needed to learn in order to remember. But uh, you had a thought about uh, Peter's words there and, and stirring them up by reminder. Yeah, Second Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 12, it says, For this reason I will not be negligent to... To remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Yes, I think it is right, as long as I am in this tent, to stir you up by reminding you, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. And what is that reminder? Well, How does he remind us today? Well, he got his letter. We just read it. <laughs> there you go. So, it's as simple yeah. as that, isn't it? So many people mm -hmm. are looking for signs. They're looking for what to do next. They're forgetting to go back to the good old gospel, the things that Peter mm -hmm. said. It says, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave you a reminder. And this is what you need to know. All the apostles use the same uh, kind of attitude. I, I like Ephesians in particular, Ephesians 3, when he's talking about the things that he said and shared with them. He says, Look back at what I've written to you. I've written to you already about these things. The Thessalonians, he says, he says, I've already spoken to you about these things. Now I'm writing them to you. And so the apostles did exactly what the Lord commanded them to do in revealing uh, the gospel of the Lord. And so they were to refer to these things to think of a, in a spiritual, spiritual way. You know, 1 Corinthians 3 in verse 3 <clears throat> He again rebukes them and uses that terminology carnal once again. It's the second time he uses this term, uh, which simply means thinking, you know, in a fleshly mind, a, a physical mind. Mm -hmm. um, and he says here, for you are still carnal. Uh, I've given you, I fed you with the milk and, and, and you haven't received the word as you should. You haven't received it as solid food and gone on and grown in your knowledge and understanding of God's word. So you're still in that carnal state. You're still thinking with the flesh and mind. And anybody that first becomes a Christian or a student of God's word is going to be thinking with a fleshly mind for some, for some time until they really uh, start to think spiritually and begin to understand these things. When I became a Christian at a very young age, I'll admit, I, I knew the facts of the Bible. I knew the Bible said, do this and do that. And here's why you do it. But to understand that and to grow in faith, um, that took years. And I'm still working on that, uh, mm -hmm. still growing, I hope, in faith and, and becoming stronger in, in the Lord as well as the knowledge of God's word. But again, he compares spiritual thinking with that term uh, being mere men. In other words, thinking and behaving in a human sense, as a human would, without spiritual uh, guidance. It kind of goes back to uh, chapter one in our, our recent studies in verses 11 through 13, where he talks about the contentions that were among the brethren in this congregation. And he said, he, here's the problem. Some of you are saying I'm of Paul or I'm of Apollos, another preacher of the gospel. I'm of Cephas, uh, which is another uh, term for uh, uh, Simon Peter, or I am of Christ. And uh, he asked the question, the rhetorical question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
And so he mentions these names again. He comes back to the same subject, even though he's talked about several other things between then and now in chapter two. But in chapter three, he comes back to the heart of the problem, the root of the problem. And he says here in verse four, for when one says, I am of Paul and another, I am Apollos, are you not carnal? Are you not carnal? And so we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, who are we following? Uh, a lot of mm -hmm. times people aren't asking, what are they following? They're more interested in who they're following. And uh, that's, yeah. that's terminology that's seeped into our, you know, society today. I mean, I've got no problem with the terminology. You, you go to Facebook or Twitter or some other kind of thing and, and you follow somebody, you know, in other words, mm -hmm. you, you click on that link and everything that they post, everything they say pops up in your feed. So uh, you're privy to what's in their heart and their mind, you know, and what's going on in their lives. And so uh, we, we follow the information of one another. But yet, if we reason like men, and we put more emphasis upon what a man says or what a man writes, are we following the Lord? And I think that's an important question that, that has to be addressed. Um, hey, Chris. You know, we're, go ahead. Yeah, it, it, it really echoes to the pettiness of divisions a lot of times. Uh, I know the church is split over doctrinal things, uh, you know, mm -hmm. standing over the truth. But how many times have you seen in your time uh, churches splitting over petty differences, you know, just personalities and, and brethren and not getting along with one another just because another brother doesn't exactly espouse the same opinion that they do, you know, and I, and I use the word opinion as, as a, uh, as a term to show that it's neither right nor wrong, you know, right. it's, it, it happens all the time. Uh, it happens to brethren all the time. And if, if it's not going to split the church, you can certainly divide brethren and whether they're not in fellowship or they're not in harmony with one another. And, you know, it's, it's a problem. It, it's certainly a problem. If it can happen in the church, how much worse can it happen in the godless society? And do we not see it? It happens everywhere. I remember in my youth and uh, worshiping with some brethren somewhere um, that, uh, there, there was a lot of that. There was a lot of the, the back and forth among personalities. And, and I actually made the statement one time and I bite my tongue when I say it, but I'm like, you know, sometimes I just wish we could just be arguing over a doctrinal issue. <laughs> that would be a whole lot easier to nip it in the bud. You might say now don't get us wrong when it comes to personality conflicts and, and any kind of conflict among the brethren in some ways that is a doctrinal issue. Uh, but we hope that you understand what we mean when we talk about the difference between personality, because, you know, a bad attitude can condemn a man's soul. And so doctrine mm -hmm. is involved in those things. And when we talk about doctrinal issues, we're usually talking about things, whether they pertain to salvation or church organization or uh, certain matters of belief. But when it comes to personality conflicts, yeah, those are the toughest things to deal with. Uh, those mm -hmm. are the hardest things that I, in my experience as a preacher, uh, for about 30 years now that I, I've, I've run into that were the hardest and most heart wrenching uh, things to deal with in regard to the stubbornness of man. And sometimes uh, we all believe the same thing in regard to doctrinal issues of salvation and church organization and so on. But for some reason um, people weren't getting along and I'm like, you know, you, these are the people that you're going to spend eternity with. Right. But you know, that's another thing. If you don't love one another here, how are you going to love each other for all eternity? And I, I just don't think a lot of people are going to make it to heaven, even though they may teach the truth regarding some doctrinal issues. Uh, yeah. Their attitude is going to keep them uh, from the gates of heaven. And so we, we mm -hmm. have to be very careful. But where and, do we get our information? The warning. Hmm? Yeah. The, the warnings right here in the text, you know, when you start acting that way and you say, I am of this opinion or I am of that opinion, we're acting like human beings that are debased and just animals. You know, we're, we're not acting like the spiritual people who have been changed and, and molded in the image of God again. Uh, you know, because we cast off that old person and we are recreated in, you know, in the image of God through Christ. It's 
uh, we, we're held to a new standard and and sometimes we have to be able to just let some of that pettiness just go and just deal with what is actually more important and and Paul's it, it's sad Paul has to you know expose a church you know for doing that and and I, I think I think it's good because um, to see that churches you know they're, they're not always going to be perfect uh, because they're filled with imperfect people well and but I, go ahead i'm sorry but but we we, we see that uh churches really need i mean a church as a whole they it really needs to uh they, they they need to look inwardly and and to check the heart of the congregation uh, Jesus would talk about the church in Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2. Uh, you do a lot of good things, but you've left your first love. Repent from where you are and then do the first works. Uh, or I'm going to come and remove the lampstand. And he's talking to the church as a whole. We usually think of repentance as a individual responsibility. But it may be a church responsibility too if the church is, is not being the, the city that is set on a hill or that salt of the earth. Well, that's a great example. You know, you used uh, examples in Revelation. Of course, you know, Paul uh, dealt with that too. When he dealt with the Corinthians, as we'll see in chapter five in uh, a few weeks, maybe <laughs> we'll get to it. But uh, he, he told them as a whole how they needed to, you know, act uh, in, 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 in acting toward discipline. And later in, in second Corinthians, how they as a whole also needed to learn to forgive and have an mm -hmm. attitude of repentance. But, you know, this idea of men following men, I mean, <clears throat> the people that are listed here, he's not talking about false teachers even. I mean, Paul, Apollos, Cephas, Jesus Christ, they all taught the same thing. But yet, mm -hmm. for some reason, you know, they were jumping on this bandwagon of, of maybe it was pride. Maybe it was arrogance. It's like, oh, yes, I'm, I'm a, you know, I was, I was baptized by Apollos. That, that puts me up here, you know, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and so on. But even Paul says, I, I thank God that I only baptized some of you and not all of you. Uh, but mm -hmm. yet he's not saying he didn't, that they weren't all baptized. And that's another issue, but people right. love to pull that verse out of context. But, um, you know, I've seen churches that put more emphasis on um, their preacher. And um, mm -hmm. believe me, as a preacher, <laughs> we, we like to be complimented. We like to be assured that we're, you know, doing a good work. I mean, the Bible does teach and we'll, we'll see this in verse seven, I think, but uh, some other passages we might consider are throughout scripture shows us that, you know, those that teach and preach are to be respected, uh, supported, uh, but they aren't to be worshiped. Uh, are mm -hmm. they to be honored? Yeah. Acts 28 and verse 10 shows us an example of that, but yet they're not to be looked at as gods. We don't follow a man. And uh, you know, uh, Peter himself in Acts chapter 10 and verse 17, when he went to the house of Cornelius, uh, they bowed before him. He said, rise up. I too am also just man. And mm -hmm. so we're going to be talking more about that. Probably, probably in our next study, uh, we'll have time to get to that. But if we reason like men, and if we put our emphasis upon following only the words of men, the men are fallible. Uh, men make mistakes certainly we've made many mistakes over the years and we'll continue to do so. Uh, this is not excusing mistakes, but it is to remind us that we're all human beings and that we do um, reason and think like human beings. And we're doing our best to think with a more spiritual mind. And that takes a little bit of trial and error as well. But here's the thing. Let's say you trust, you're listening to uh, Chris and Nick this morning and, um, Let's say you trust in the things that we say. You find that what we say is in accordance to God's word, and, and we appreciate that. But what happens when another man comes along, when somebody else comes along and gives you a message that maybe in your mind sounds a little better, but yet that message is going to take you away from the Bible? Then what do you do? When you get yourself into a habit of following one man, chances are good you're going to end up following somebody else because one man's going to let you down. One's man's going to disappoint you. Men have to be corrected. Men have to alter their course from time to time. And we as preachers have to do the same thing. But we have responsibility to teach and preach the gospel so that we don't lead people astray. So what if somebody comes along that maybe, um, well, let's just put it this way. I've seen churches fall apart and divide because they hired a smooth-talking preacher rather than a truth-talking preacher. 
Mm-hmm. And what I've seen is that uh, groups have appointed elders and leaders that had no substance and knowledge of God's word. And I've seen those churches crumble because of that. And it all seemed good and fine and, and interesting at the time. But let me tell you something. You need to look at the substance of a man. Paul the Apostle said in Galatians 1 and verse 10, Do I seek to please men? If I sought to please men, I would not be a servant or a bondservant of Jesus Christ. And so we serve our Lord. And so if as preachers you want to impress anybody, impress God first. And then those who are godly will be impressed by you. So there's a proper order to these things. I would think uh, there's going back to that idea of pride that you were talking about, Chris, um, you know, Paul is an apostle, which is something to rally behind. No, we, we're the followers of the apostle Paul. Uh, but Apollos, if you remember back in Acts chapter 18, uh, he is described as an eloquent man, uh, meaning he can speak very well. Uh, and back in that time period, uh, someone who could speak really well was extremely popular. Uh, they had, they were able to command a lot of power and, and a lot of respect in society. Uh, orators, I think is what they, they were called. Uh, was it Cicero is one of the most famous Roman orators of his day. Uh, this, this was something to, to be, uh, you know, looked up and, and to try to achieve. And Apollos was there. He had it. And the church in Corinth had him as a preacher. And so, I mean, it is a matter of pride to say, look, uh, we're followers of Apollos. I mean, he's, he's a good speaker, man. Listen sure. to him. <laughs> you know, that's the thing. I mean, uh, not, Paul commended the, the preaching and the teaching of, of some of his brethren and what good servants they were. But remember, Apollos had a problem, you know, from the very beginning. He was an eloquent man. Uh, but we have to remember, too, that he had to be corrected in regard to uh, the teaching of uh, baptism into Jesus Christ. He only knew uh, up to John's message and the coming of the Lord. And, uh, but once he learned that, uh, uh, he, he changed. He, you know, he continued on the right path. I mean, he was almost there, but he was mm-hmm. not a man uh, that knew everything. And, and this is one of the things that you'll find throughout Scripture, which is why I keep referencing Proverbs, is that it teaches us that the wise man receives rebuke. The wise Mm -hmm. man continues learning. The wise man doesn't know everything, but uh, he opens his heart and his mind to what is the truth. And he applies those things. And and I think about where people get their information from and uh, you know, how we need to be on guard and and be corrected from time to time. Um, You know, I I made a statement and I've always forgot to correct myself on this. I think I did uh, in writing on uh, one of our YouTube programs. And I don't know if you remember this, Nick, a few weeks back, um, we had talked about, um, uh, maybe it was one that you were on with me. I can't remember now, but anyway, we had talked about, you know, who baptizes who. And Mm -hmm. and I just made a statement that, uh, you know, Christians baptize Christians. And, and I think we all understand what we mean when I say that, uh, that I, I don't go seeking people of the world to teach me the gospel and baptize me into Jesus Christ. Well, one of my good brethren, a good friend of mine said, you know, Christians don't baptize Christians. And I said, yeah. And I, it still wasn't, wasn't you know, jiving with me what he meant. He said, Christians <laughs> baptize sinners. And I'm like, oh, you're, that's a good point, you know. <laughs> yeah. And he really caught me on that. And it's just a simple uh, kind of misuse of my words there. But, but it does change the perspective that if somebody heard me say that and, and heard me, uh, you know, indicate perhaps that a person was a Christian before being baptized, well, that changes the entire doctrine of what the Bible teaches, doesn't it? And so I appreciate him for pointing that out. And I've, I've been meaning, I keep forgetting to bring that up again. And, and it just goes to show that sometimes we misuse our words. We kind of know what we mean when it rattles around in our mind. And you certainly right. know what we mean by our, by our teaching and so on. But here's the thing about that is that when it comes to using Bible terms and Bible ways, uh, you know, we need to stick with, with God's word. And what we find uh, in the church is that, uh, um, if you wanted to become a Christian, you know, you had to recognize you were in sin and you needed to be baptized in Jesus Christ. And, and typically what we find is they, a member of the Lord's body, um, a preacher, a teacher, or a fellow brother would be the one that would help and administer that. Um, and so that, that's just an appropriate way of doing that. 
but anyway, you know, you hear terms and, and it reminded me of another statement I heard uh, years ago when my, my oldest son uh, came home from school talking about something outlandish. I don't even remember what it was now, but this would happen every once in a while. And he'd make a statement and I'd be like, son, where did you hear that? And he'd say, well, some school, some kid at school told me, <laughs> I'm like, okay, there's your problem to begin with. <laughs> you know? right. First of all, consider the source of your information. And that's the problem going on in our world today. Somebody's yeah. talking about something somewhere or something. Somebody's tweeting this and that or whatever. But just because it's Twisting. posted on Facebook or in the major you know, news right. cycles doesn't mean that it's true. Uh, and so consider how many your times, source. Chris, how many times, Chris, have you uh, seen a post on Facebook? You're like, oh, wow, that is horrible. How could so-and-so say such a thing? And then you go and do a little quick fact check on that. <laughs> and you're like, that was totally not what they said. You yep. know, there's no, I mean, it, it happens. I, I see it. I see it both on the conservative and the liberal side. You know, I see people oh, posting yeah. liberal stuff. I see people posting conservative stuff. And boy, it can really enrage somebody uh, mm -hmm. with these statements. And then... Or a picture. But if you go and look, yeah, or a picture, you go look. I see people it's, post it's pictures fake. all the time and say, this happened in such and such country. When you do a little investigating, you realize that picture was taken in 2008 in a totally yeah. unrelated situation. You got to investigate yeah. everything you read. I, I, yeah. I, I, social media, I mean, we, we are obviously using social media to, sure. to put out this uh, a program like on YouTube and, and uh, share it on Facebook and stuff like that. But I think in many ways it, it has made us uh, more susceptible to being hoodwinked and fooled. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, we got to, come back to the wisdom of God, not the wisdom of man, as what Paul's saying here in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, and and if we're going to be dividing over petty stuff like that that we find on Facebook and get angry at brethren and, and Christians because of, of Facebook posts while wow, we're, uh, you know, we're, we, we might as well just say that we are of Paul, we're of Apollos sure. in uh, we, we need to look at the heart of the matter and we need to go back to the true foundation. Uh, and, and, you know, I had this thought a few minutes ago and, and now I've got some other thoughts too. <laughs> so my mind's going off. <laughs> There's crazy. a lot we're going to have to say but, for next right, week. We've got about five minutes yeah. left of our program. <laughs> yes, already. Well, let yeah, me say this. It's a quick so, hour, hasn't it? Yeah. So you're right. It was, it was Hosea chapter four, verse six. Um, but when it comes to, the church and the divisions that exist and, and this rivalry and bitterness that people will have. If we were to just do things the proper way, you know, say you and I had something against one another, like maybe you said something that offended me. You may not have intended it to be offensive, but it did offend me. You know, that, that does happen. It's legitimate. I don't need to be airing that out across social media or through the church and say, Hey, you know, Chris Kramer says such and such about me. Isn't he uh, a hypocrite of a preacher? You know, that, that that's not going to solve anything. The proper thing to do is take what Jesus Christ said. If you know, if a brother has sinned against you, you go and tell him his faults. And if he repents, then you have gained a brother. I mean, you kept it private there, you know, and you had an opportunity to repent of that. Or if you know that that you've sinned against somebody, say, I said something that offended you. And I and I, it came back to me saying, oh, well, I, I, uh, I've offended Chris or I've, I've, you know, I've done something against him. Then I have a responsibility in Matthew chapter five to leave my gift at the altar and go and reconcile with my brother. Uh and again, exactly. keeping it private, uh, there's, there's a lack of that. And people want to just expose the hypocrisy or why, so by, or why, why somebody is wrong without actually dealing with the sin itself. And, and that's a problem that we need to, to recognize that we got to do things the right way if we're going to truly reconcile with one another and have that unity. Uh, and, and so that's, that's what I was, one thing I just want to share. Well, yeah, that's a great point. And go back and uh, uh, for those of you listening, you can go back and uh, listen to the last two videos on our Second Thessalonians study, and we actually cover that topic in, in quite some detail because Paul addresses it in Thessal uh, to the Thessalonians, and of course uh, Matthew chapter five and Jesus' beautiful outline there as to how to handle situations like that. Uh, we tried to be thorough in, in talking about that, but I I'm thinking about too 
what overcomes all of that? You know, you, you talked about getting to the root of the problem. And as Paul, the apostle, I believe is getting to the root of the problem and talking about their lack of spiritual mm -hmm. maturity here. Uh, one thing that we'll often see come up is of course, teaching about love. And if we as brethren love one another, when we occasionally trip up and, and we offend one another by statements or words, or even whether we meant them or not, um, because of love, we're going to approach one another. Because of love, we're going to um, work, work it out and be apologetic yeah. to each other and, and help each other through it. And that's the problem. People aren't going into, the, into their problems and divisions with first an attitude of love uh, in right. anything. And they're letting the basis of, okay, if Nick, if you agree with me, then I'll love you. You know, it, that's, that's the approach that people seem to be taking. And, and they're forgetting that they need to love first and then work out those issues where they can come together in a state of unity. We don't have to be in disagreement. And it may take us years to work some things out. But the fact is, are we going to open our hearts and we're going to study God's word about it? Or are we just yeah. going to go into our separate corners and, and uh, you know, complain against one another? And what ends up happening is we draw people to our side, you draw people to your side, and then you have camps against one another. And after a while, it's, you know, pardon the old expression, but the old Hatfield McCoy, uh, you know, uh, deal from people don't even know what that argument was about anymore. You know, yeah. <laughs> there's going to be somebody out there Googling that now saying, Oh, I, I yeah, know what the was, argument is. You know, it was, it was about the logging of his property. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was about moonshine. You know, I don't know yeah. whatever it was. What yeah. we find is that those things go down in history and, um, as no rhyme or reason as to why they're still fighting today. Yeah. And it's become that way in churches. Uh, it's become that way among individuals and certainly become that way in our world and among politics and things like that. We are about out of time here and uh, we're going to have to leave off with about verse five there and uh, pick up with our study next week. But I want to leave uh, everyone with this thought here as we continue our thoughts next week and talk about the responsibilities of planting and watering and giving God the credit for the increase in the church. And I'll just read verse five for you right now. Who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. Um, a passage that you might want to refer to in your own studies is first Timothy four verses 12 through 16. And I won't have time to read it right now, but Paul is encouraging Timothy as a young man and as a preacher. Um, when we think about what makes a minister, um, mm -hmm. it's a good study to go to first and second Timothy and Titus as well. But he says, be an example to believers in your conduct in the things that you say, obviously in love, in spirit in faith and purity. Um, he talks about having studious habits and, and meditating upon the word of God and giving, uh, attention to reading and to exhortation. He talks about growing. And of course, ultimately in verse 15, he talks about, um, you know, the message of salvation that saves, you know, not only ourselves, but those who hear us. We have a big responsibility there. You know, any last thoughts, Nick, as we close our program today? If I can real fast, uh, John chapter 13, um, where, where Jesus said, you can read real fast. He said, by this, all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love for one another. And yeah, it has to be the foundation, you know, it's love. Great verse to end on. Well, we thank you all for listening to our program uh, this morning. You can go back and listen to it again on our YouTube channel. Just do a search for Northside Church of Christ, Russellville, Kentucky. Uh, go to our website and you'll find links to YouTube and to our Facebook page. And of course, the contact information that you need in order to contact us. Let us know what your questions and comments might be. And we'll talk about those in our next program. Uh, the Lord wills next Saturday morning at uh, nine o'clock on YouTube and nine Oh five right here on WRUS. Well, thank you so much for joining us this morning and have a wonderful day. This has been Bible talks. 
It is our prayer that you have been edified and more determined to rightly divide the Word of God. Tune in next Saturday and we will study again.